Okay, so let's talk today about system fundamentals because you grade 12s put the fun in fundamentals. All right, so let's start with some general stuff. The word computer is, let's, that's a simple place to start, is a derivative of a Latin and French origin word, computer and puter, I'll enjoy my French Latin accent, which essentially means to think, to estimate, to count. That's what the word means. So it's basically a device used to help you to count and think. That's what a computer origin. And by the way, that word was used well before the devices in front of you now. Computers was used to describe people at one time. People were the computers. Now, system, also an old word, comes from the Latin systema, which meant an organized whole composed of parts. So parts creating a whole is what a system or a systema is. So what we're talking about here is a bunch of stuff, parts, organized into a whole to help us think and count. So it's a pretty broad term. When you think of computing devices or computer systems, all kinds of devices start popping into your mind. From laptops, to tablets, to smartphones, to gaming systems, to peripherals, to printers, to virtual reality machines. There's all kinds of different things that can appear as part of this overarching umbrella called a computer system, okay? The word peripheral, I want to pause on for a second. What would you define the word peripheral as? Have you ever heard that word before? What would you say it is? What, how would you make a definition for that? A device added to the computer, what were you going to say? Okay, so would you consider a keyboard a peripheral? Yeah. Would you consider a monitor a peripheral? Yeah. Okay, so they're, they're not, not necessarily necessary for the device to function, right? A computer could work without a monitor and it could work without a keyboard. Is a mouse a peripheral? Yeah. Printer? Yeah. Okay, so I, I like that. That's a good definition. Okay. Now, if you get a job in the computer industry, one degree job title includes the term system analyst. So people who have computer science degrees often have that job. And they would obviously analyze, design, and implement a computer system. Okay? To do that, they have to be familiar with the hardware, familiar with the software, familiar with how it all kind of comes together as an organized whole. But even that term, system analyst, is an umbrella term. There's, for example, change manage analysts who are all about how do I change over a system. There's business analysts who analyze more so how it works in conjunction with the business. There's software analysts who specialize in specifically the software, not necessarily the hardware. Okay? Up to this point in computer science, we've focused on programming, and that's a good thing because programming is the main tool of the computer scientist. But it is a much broader term than that. And that's why I want to start the 42 SIB course by looking at that. Now, even the word analyst can be replaced by a couple other different words, like developer was very popular right now. So it could be a computer systems developer, administrator, or architect, or even the word engineer could go in there. These words are now starting to become interchangeable for the job that these people undertake. So when you get a degree in computer science, it tends to over arc over all of these sort of job titles. Here's just some examples of actual titles of people working in the world right now who have a degree in computer science. Software system developer. So notice the words computer and science don't even appear in that job title. Business information analyst, web developer, database administrator, network system architect, computer programmer, game quality assurance tester, software application developer. In reality, this is just mixing the concepts together. Computer science is an umbrella term that includes all those things. Sure, programming is probably the main tool 
of most of these people's job, but maybe not so much for the business information analyst. They may not be coding on a daily basis. Sure, a computer programmer is coding on a daily basis. In addition, let's mix engineering into this. Engineering is very close in some ways. Specifically now, even at our university, they offer computer engineering. And a lot of its coursework overlaps with computer science now. That's why, by the way, when we go to the U of M, you'll notice the computer science department is in the engineering building. They're in the same building. Here are some actual screen caps of jobs from 2014-15 in the computer science industry. Number one, software application developer. Two, computer system analyst. Three, computer system engineer. Four, network system administrator. Five, database administrator. Six, business intelligence analyst. Fancy words, but let's dig a little deeper. Let's read, for example, Business intelligent analysts, what it describes its daily duties to be. Analyze market strategies by examining competitors and trends. Collect and compile data from public information, industry reports, or purchase sources. Produce business intelligence and trend data to support recommendations for plans of action. Now, how are they going to produce that data? How will you make business data happen? You could use Excel. You could use Microsoft Word, or you could be writing custom software that actually produces data from other data. If we go back to software applications developer, their daily duties. Design or customize computer app software. Modify existing software to optimize operational efficiency or correct errors. Evaluate software requirements and user needs to determine software feasibility. That one sounds more like the stuff you guys have done in the course so far. But again, there's a lot of overlap here. All of these, what I left off there, was it said minimum requirements, computer science degree or related degree. Okay? Sure, if they're hiring a business intelligence analyst, they'd like probably a computer science degree and a business degree would be a good idea. Right? Whereas the software app developer, maybe not so much. They may be looking for a computer science degree and lots of experience. Right? So sure, it's a broad field now. Okay? Here's a thing as well that showed uh, median hour, average salary, annual salary, and job openings over time. And just a few of the different sort of places in there. Let me zoom in on that so you guys can see that closer. Okay? So if we go to the far extreme of salary, we see software app developers, okay? Or sorry, they have the most job openings and they have one of the higher salaries. Highest salary, software system developer, but they don't have as many jobs in that area, right? So this one, software app developer, seems to be in both a high uh, demand for money and high demand for jobs. Less demand for jobs and less money down here, web developers. Okay? Now, that's still a good job. It's still a highly needed field. The thing is about web developers, they don't generally need as much qualifications. There are people who can do that job by just learning to code kind of, as a lot of people can, just at things like code camps or on the internet and stuff like that. And in that industry, they're still tending to allow people into that industry if they can just do the job. And this is an odd thing. This is, computers is kind of the last sort of job industry where that's allowed. Now, I've, I've maybe said this to you guys before. Imagine you researched online how to perform a vasectomy. And you went into the Grace Hospital and said, I'd like to apply for a job here to do vasectomies. I'm, and they'd say, well, are you a doctor? Nope, but I know how to do it. I've done it before, and I saw online how to do it. They would throw you out. <laughs> they would say, no, no, no. Go get your, go get a, go get, become a doctor, and then we'll let you in here. Okay, so say you go online and you learn how to build a bridge. You learn, oh, is there I build a bridge? You go to the city of Winnipeg and you go, you know what? I'm going to build you a bridge. Can you, would you mind giving me millions of dollars and I'll build a bridge for you? And they'll say, <laughs> well, they say, <laughs> all right, now we're getting political in here. But they would say to you, okay, let's say it's not Winnipeg. It's a city where you're not politically involved. They'd say, well, are you an engineer? Are you an architect? No, but I know how to do it. 
most industries, that's just not the way it works. But in computers, especially the web, that is kind of still the world it's in. They say, you know what? Let's see your portfolio. Oh, look, you've made a whole bunch of websites. Okay, we'll hire you to do this website. That's generally not the case in software development outside the web now. And I can refer you to several old um, students of mine who found that out. I had students who would come to my computer science class who often knew everything I was teaching from the code standpoint. They would come in and say, yeah, you know, I know, I know how to do link lists. I know how to do all that stuff. I already know how to do threads, and I've done that stuff before. I learned it online. Okay, I don't deny that fact that people can learn code online. They even then went and decided to try, say, uh, one of them I know for a fact went to Waterloo and decided to do computer science and realized, I don't know if I need to do this. I think I can probably get a job right now. And he tried that. He decided to, especially in the United States, he went down and said, because he got a co-op down there, and they said, you know what, what would happen if I just left my degree and came to work here right now? They said, we ain't going to let you. One, you don't have a green card, so we're not going to let you into the United States. Two, we don't let people into the United States who don't have a work visa for coming in. Three, we don't hire anyone without at least a computer science degree. It's kind of, we want that industry standard now. So in that way, the world has changed. 15 years ago when I started teaching, I did see that. There were students who were actually doing software development and didn't quite finish degrees. It still kind of exists in the web world, but in the rest of the software development world, it's generally not the case anymore. You need to have that sort of certification to, to kind of get going there. I mean, there's still amateurs everywhere. There's amateur bridge builders out there. There's probably amateur surgeons out there. God, I hope not amateur vasectomy people, but you never know. All right. What's going on? Where's my... Am I frozen? Oh, I know why. There we go. So maybe look at it this way. Okay? Computer science exists in overlapping circles. Where, yes, absolutely, software development programming is a big part of it. Sure, some hardware engineering could be part of computer science. It's not necessarily the focus, but a lot of what we do does have a, and you're going to see this here, an engineering aspect to it. But there's also a management aspect. People in computer science become bosses in computer science. So now training and managerial skills is also a part of what computer science is. Okay. That's my intro. Let's dive into the curriculum now. Here's what the curriculum actually says you have to know. One, define the terms hardware, software, peripheral, network, and human resources. For the most part, I hope that's pretty simple. I thought you might get tripped up on peripheral, but you guys mastered that, no problem. Describe the roles that a computer can take in the network world. Again, that's a pretty simple concept, but there is some examples here. Client server, email server, DNS server, router, and firewall. If you're not totally familiar with those words, don't worry. I'm going to go over them. Okay? Social and ethical issues associated with the network world. Ethical issues? Oh, crap. At least one of you is saying, are we going back to TOK? A little. Um, develop an appreciation of the social and ethical issues associated with development computer systems. Okay. So let's break down some of that terminology. Hardware. The honest answer, the easiest way I can define hardware is the stuff you can touch. So keyboard is hardware. Monitor is hardware. Memory sticks is hardware. CPU is hardware. Software is the stuff you can't touch because it's electronic. Hardware, software. Peripheral, my definition. A device connected to a host computer, but not part of the core computer architecture, but expands the host capabilities. For example, printer, mouse, monitor, keyboard, etc. Okay? Network is a series of points or nodes, notice that word come back, interconnected by communication paths on the system. Networks can interconnect with other networks to form larger networks, i.e. the internet, and contain smaller sub-networks within the network which is what we are on right now when we log in. We're on a small network connected to a larger network. Sturgeon Heights has a network connected to the St. James School Division, which has a network connected to 
Winnipeg's Merlin online service provider, which provides the servicing, which is connected to what's called a VBNS, a very high backbone speed nerve. Uh, I can't remember the exact. That's connected to the internet. <laughs> I, I go over it in our hardware unit. Okay. And then human resources, interconnecting the humans with the system itself. What's that? Stick them into the computer, yeah. Okay, let's go over some other terms. Client is a general term, a piece of computer hardware or software, and a human, by the way, as well, uh, that access services made available by the server. There are three types of clients. I think I'm the first one. Fat clients, a bulk of processing operations itself and does not rely heavily on the server, okay? These computers are fat clients. When you go and start Microsoft Word, it doesn't need to talk to the server to do that. It can do it right here on this computer. When does it need to talk to the server? When you log in. When you hit print, it talks to the server. Um, sure, the internet is talking to a lot of servers, but we'll kind of avoid that. Now, thin clients do rely on the services of the server in a heavy way, right? Now, this is not the system you're used to. But if you go to, say, supercomputer systems, or at U of M when you use their Linux labs, their machines don't really have any software on them. When you start software, you're starting it on a big computer, and you're relying. So if that computer goes out, all the clients go out. Okay? Hybrid clients would be a mix. I would argue that these are more a hybrid system, but it's just some general terminology to describe what's going on at the level of the client. Okay? Clients usually connect to servers, which connect to other servers in different ways, including client server networks or peer-to-peer -peer networks. We're going to get into more of that when we talk about networking per se. Okay? The server is a combination of software and hardware that administers the operation of its clients. Okay? So we have clients and one or more servers. Okay, we can have one client and one server, but that's not that good of a system. We can have multiple clients and one server. We can have multiple clients and multiple servers. There's different, depending on the need, there's different combinations of things that can go on there. Okay. Now, in the server, the actual hardware can vary. But usually you want your server to have really good hardware, usually better hardware, than your clients, because it's kind of the boss, right? So it needs to have really good hardware compared to the clients, okay? So to help it along the way, we have other pieces of hardware involved, like a router. A router is just a device that helps with organizing the messages that go out from the clients and the servers to each one another, okay? Um, the router is often a physical device. I will take you guys on a mini field trip to our school server room to see the routers, not today. Firewalls are security measures, both software base and hardware base, that help keep access to the network specified to who should have access to the network. Okay? Again, you can do this both from the hardware side and the software side. So that term firewall is a very general term to describe both hardware and software solutions, okay? Messages entering or leaving the network will often pass through the firewall to determine if they are allowed out or if they're allowed in through that firewall to block or let pass those specific messages. Okay, so that was the first part of the curriculum. Let's look at the next section of the curriculum, okay? A few more terms you need to know. One. Identify the relevant stakeholders when planning a new system. I hope that's something you guys addressed in your, in your assignment so far. So the role of the end user must be considered. You don't build a computer system for a bunch of people that you've never talked to before, or you will get it wrong, okay? Two, describe the methods of obtaining requirements from the stakeholders. So how do I know what they need? So this could include a survey, an interview, direct observations, etc. So again, there's some more information here from the IB, but that's generally just an idea of what you need to do. Describe the techniques for gathering that information needed to arrive at a solution. Um, examining current systems, competing products, 
organizational capabilities, literature searches. So someone who's on the business side of computer science knows this stuff well. They know their competitor. They know, here are my, here are my clients. How am I going to find out what they really need? If you're not doing that, you're not doing a good job from the business side. Construct suitability representations to illustrate system requirements. Examples include system flowcharts, data flowcharts, structure charts. UMLs are not required, but you guys have seen what UMLs look like. Okay? So you should know a few flowchart symbols and possibly some pseudocode because it might show up on the AIB exam. Okay? Don't worry, we're going to go over that. Describe the purpose of prototypes to demonstrate the proposed system to the client. What is a prototype? How do I use it? That's coming up. So this is the stuff I'm now going to cover with you in that. Oh, a couple more. The importance of iteration through the design process. Who knows what the word iteration means? You do know what it means, but do you know what's supposed to be? Like different uh, versions of it? No. Nope. nope. I'll give you a hint. It was an actual unit in your grade 10 course to iterate. Iteration. It means looping. Iteration just means to repeat, okay, or to create a loop, a feedback loop, as we're going to see. So iteration essentially just means why is there looping when designing? Because sometimes you have to come back to where you started from to redesign, okay? You could also think of it as recursion, right? You are reoccurring with something you did before. The word cycle there would have been your clue as well. Okay, what are the consequences of failing to involve the users in the design process? You get angry users, yeah. And you might have crappy software that doesn't actually do what it's supposed to. The social and ethical issues associate, associate with the introduction of that. So what impact will this have on their socio and ethical um, viability in that system? Okay. So let's dive into this content. Okay. So now we know the terms. So we know we're going to bring in a new system. And we know we need to analyze what's about to go on. So let's first start by looking at the system. So you're going to come into a new company and change it. You should at least watch how the company operates first. You'd be surprised how sometimes that doesn't happen. Someone just comes in with a whole bunch of ideas on change when they've never actually seen what's going on in that system. Okay? So this is where you're that awkward guy just sitting in the store. Maybe you work at that where someone's in there just watching you work. It's awkward, but that's what they're doing. They're observing what's going on. What's the pros for observation? Well. Um, you can see a lot more stuff going on. So that's a pro to that. A con is that people might change their behavior by you observing. That's known as the observer effect, right? Um, plus, you don't necessarily have hard data when you just observe people. You don't know whether this is actually doing a good job or actually doing a bad job. To you, it might just look okay. So observation is very informal, and that's a good thing. But it's also a bad thing because you're not getting hard data. So that's the pros and cons of observation, which, by the way, could be an IB exam question. What are the pros and cons of observing a change in a new system or observing before a change in a new system? So these are just some examples of answers you could give. Focus groups. Okay? So you get a bunch of employees together and start asking them questions. Okay? Before you read it, what's the pros for that? What would be the benefit of getting a bunch of people together in a room and saying, what do you guys like about the way this company works right now? What do you dislike? What's the advantage of that? You get to hear all their opinions. Very often, you don't involve their bosses. And you say to them, I'm here for change. I'm not your boss. So tell me what you don't like about it, and it'll stay private in this room. So sometimes you can get some more honesty out of people that way. Okay. So interact with participants, pose questions, probe more deeply. They can really, they can write information down. Sometimes you see, like you see here, that two-way mirror in a focus group. That means, and people know what that is, right? So they may not think that they're completely anonymous. You can get some facial cl clues, some body language from that. Okay. All right. Now, usually with a focus group, you make sure you have the right people in there. If you have just the bosses and say, what's great about our business? They're going to give you one piece of information, and then you bring in all the, say, clerks. They might give you a completely different piece of information. Now, is it a benefit to mix the two groups? Depends, right? Cons. Well, again, in a focus group, especially if your boss is at the table, 
You may be not willing to say, well, I don't like the fact that my boss is bugging me all the time. I wish you'd just leave me alone and I'd get my work done, right? So there are cons to focus groups as well, right? So I think I have an example here. Survey question answers options lead to unclear data because certain answer options may be interpreted differently. For example, the answer is somewhat agree may be different to some people depending on the subject. And yes and no answers might be different depending on the question. So sometimes it's tricky to get the good information out of survey groups. So if you say, does everybody like the new drink machine we put in the front foyer? Yes, no. And so now you're not, someone might say yes, but really there's more to their answer than that, right? Then you could give it a range. Say, those of you who enjoy the new survey machine go from disagree, slightly disagree, strongly disagree, do not care, strongly agree, slightly agree. You know, like you could create this spectrum there that in itself might not as well give you the most accurate data there. Okay. You can have interviews. You can sit down face to face with different employees. The pros of that is you are talking to one person and getting their information. What's the cons of interviews? Say you're going to change down the road their Boeing Industries computer system. What will be the con of interviewing all the employees? Yeah, maybe too much time. Maybe it's not feasible to do that. You're going to say, okay, so I'm going to need about six months to interview all your employees before we start making changes. And they're like, and we're paying you how much an hour? Uh, no, I need you to finish your interviews by the end of the day, right? So then you say, well, who, how many people do I interview? Which people do I interview? So it's tricky that way. Okay, it takes a long time. People aren't working while they're in the interview. So now you're paying someone to not be working, right? So that has to go into it, right? We, don't, we can't forget about the money aspect of this, right? Okay, obviously there's more detail in my slide there than what I'm just saying to you guys, but it's just this idea again of what are the pros and what are the cons of getting information from our stakeholders. Okay, so let's say that's done. We have some information, we did some observations, we did some focus groups, and we did some interviews. We did all three. We just went in, looked at the way the business was running, we did some interviews with a few different types of employees, and we did a couple focus groups with groups of employees, okay? Now we can dig into the system. We think, well, what's the workflow of this system? What's a typical day like in this system? What are the entry points? Where does information come into the system? Where does information go out of the system? Who are the competitors for this? What are they doing right or wrong? What can we learn from our competitors? What suggestions from just within the system could we do to improve it? So without making a radical change, what slight tweaks could we make to this system? Okay? Our first change is often called a prototype change, right? So let's see what would happen if we make one slight change. Now, how we implement that has got a variety of different ways as well. So a prototype is essentially a change to the system designed to be tested by the users of the system. Okay, let's pull this back to actual software. So let's say we were gonna make some changes to Microsoft Word, okay? We interviewed Word, people who used Word in their businesses. We did some focus groups on Microsoft Word. And now we're ready to make some changes. So what we can do is make a different version of Word with a slight change to it. First of all, does it still meet the requirements of what Microsoft Word should do? Does it still able to do everything the old version did? Okay. Does it actually improve the system? So that should be at minimum what a prototype should do. Let's use your example. You guys are going to do an IA this year. Say you use last year's final project as your initial idea and you prototype it. You say, well, it's like my last year's project, but it still does what last year's did, but this is how it improves it, okay? You will then test that, debug that, because sometimes you're gonna find bugs in the prototype, obviously, okay? The bug essentially means it's not meeting one of those three criteria, okay? Which would lead you back to redesigning it, the prototype. So if a bug comes up, you go back and redesign. That's the cycle. That's the cycle where you go back to your prototyping and you might have a different version of the prototype. Okay, so the way this is described is various. 
design cycle, iterative system, or I like the feedback loop. All right, so we have just a little bit of time today to finish this. But really, it could be simply thought as think about something, make it, check it, and then that might go back to thinking and making and rechecking. Or you have an idea, you build something, you have a product, you measure whether it was successful. From that data, you might learn that something needs to change and go back to a new idea. That would be a cycle. Okay? This is an even more complex version of that cycle. Okay? And now it's getting more into software-specific wording. But it's still a cycle. It is a loop. It is an iteration. It is something that you can include prototyping in, but you develop software in a looping system. You're going to use words as well sometimes, like alpha phase testing, beta testing. These are words that are just used within that system, within the loop. Okay? All right, I think we'll pause there for today. So this is where we'll pick up tomorrow, is what this system sort of um, building looks like. And I'm going to...